this session um, NBRs, we get, I mean, we've got a lot of experience um, here with NBRs, and we get probably more questions about NBRs than any other um, product. Um, the good news is they get simpler and simpler every year. I remember the first NBR that I set up, and it was um, a harrowing experience. And the last one I set up, I was wondering, you know, should I be doing anything more? Um, it's, so, it's so fast and straightforward. Having said that, you will come across a lot of issues and um, you know, Bentley is trying to avoid fielding every one of those questions, so I hope that you guys can um, answer, the, uh, answer the questions on the spot. Um, a lot is changing with NBRs also, they're going beyond just a security item, we're seeing the next generations where NBRs have been used for everything, they've been used to track traffic flows, um, restricted areas, keeping people out of restricted areas, doing all kinds of analytics. Um, it's a part of this thing that people are talking about called big data, where we're accumulating loads of information, and NBRs are one of those critical tools. So it's something that you know we're going to get to know more and more, and it's going to become more and more popular. Probably in radio parts, I reckon we spend um, maybe one percent of our time on the NBRs related to security. The vast majority is tracking packages, having a look at customers, and all that kind of stuff. Sorry, guys, we do want you. All right, I'll uh, hand across to Ben. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mike. Wonderful. Um, all right, so for those of you who don't know me or haven't attended 50 of my training sessions on these before, I'm Ben Marshall. Uh, I'm a sales rep for Radio Parts. I'm one of our techie guys, so I tend to get involved when things go wrong. So forgive me if I take a fairly negative approach to some things. It's because I normally get all the 1% problems rather than the 99% good ones. For today, at least, I'm going to be talking about recorders. Uh, two weeks ago, we did a session on cameras themselves, talking about lens and technology choice and those sort of things for it all. Uh, my details are also up on our website so please feel free to email or call me anytime you like with a problem or with a question or to set something up or whatever else is going on. Um, we don't have a 24-7 support line here. Um, we've got a couple of guys who know our way around it pretty well but as Mike said I'd like some of you to pick up some things from today that will hopefully make my phone calls and my emails less and the more I can do of that the easier I can get through to everything else that has to be done too. Um, I, my experience with it is basically seven years worth of messing around and five years before that of thinking I knew what I was doing and then realized I didn't and then getting to the messing around stage. I have a lot of fun with this gear. Um, I hate the necessity of actually selling it because it'd be nice to live in a world where we didn't need cameras on buildings and businesses and everything else but Unfortunately, we live in this world and this is the way it goes. Um, this morning, I've got three systems set up for you. I'm going to show you a bit about each of these. We've got a DOS AHD kit, a DOS NVR with a camera, and I've got a NES HD TVI kit set up as well. Show you a bit of the quality differences, the setup differences between them all and so on. But to start with, I actually wanted to start with our website and a couple of tools that you might not know about but are very, very useful for you either getting support or doing the basic questions about uh, how much hard drive space do I need to make this thing work properly. So on every page that we have with an NVR on it or a DVR like our hybrids, we have a CCTV calculator. Now if I go into this, the options it gives me is recording, how much recording time I'm going to get depending on what hard drive I have. Every manufacturer has their own version of these depending on their own specific parameters and their own recorders and everything else. This is ours, you know, give it, use it as a guide. If it says 1. well, 6 megabits per second and it's 5.99 megabits per second, okay, it's within the realms of possibility, but just keep it in mind as a rough idea. For this sort of system here, I'm going to expand the page a bit so I can see more. Actually, it's not going to let me. All right, cool. Beautiful. All right, so got different options in terms of recording types. You've got recording resolution. So our default resolution for most of these is 1080p, but we've obviously set this up for three megapixel, the next generation recorders as well. Video quality standards. That will depend on the recorder. Highest, medium or standard will be, well, give you a different result depending on what you're looking for. Up in this corner, you've got the number of cameras, number of frames per second, how many hours per day you're recording for and how many days of the week you're recording. So, if we only want to record for a week, 
we're going to set this thing for eight cameras because this is a good standard for it. I'm going to leave it at seven frames per second for now and I'm going to change it to 12 hours a day and say that my motion detection is only going off half the day. I am looking at about a terabyte's worth of storage space to record a week at eight cameras at that sort of resolution at that sort of frame rate. Simple enough. Seven frames per second is pretty jerky. If I change that up to 13 frames per second, hey, we're up to 1.7 gig. So, uh, 1.7 terabytes. So, two terabyte drive will get me about a week's worth of recording at 50% recording cycle at that sort of frame rate. If we go up to something more like an industry standard at 25, however, now we're up to almost four terabytes or three and a half terabytes worth of storage space. So it's easy to show your customer, hey, you're going away on holiday for three weeks. Well, if we want three weeks worth of storage on this thing, we've either got to have the motion detection set up very, very carefully or change our frame rates down or put the biggest sets of hard drives we can find into it to try and cover that amount of time. For example, add on, let's have a look, three weeks worth of recording. And we're up to eight terabytes worth of storage space. So two four terabyte drives and should be good to go. Just keep that sort of thing in mind when you're specking these out for your customers as well. Doing that calculation, getting them to realize that the one terabyte one that comes in a kit might not be enough if they're going away for six months and they want to record 24 hours a day. It's a useful little tool. It's on any of the NVR pages on our website, so feel free to use it as much as you can. The other bit that's on this page is our FAQs. So there's an FAQ for each product, but we also have an FAQ page, a specific FAQ page, that has all this lot. So these are the standards and the standard questions that <coughs> particularly Wayne and I come across all the time, and the guys in the showroom as well. No cameras are found, what's the default password, all this sort of stuff is in here. Just click on it and it'll bring it up for you, nice and simply. That page we will keep adding to. If you give me a question that I haven't seen before and it's a good answer that I know, I'll put it up here so that everybody can check it at any time they want to afterwards. That all make sense? Cool. So those are on our website. You can find them under the NVR pages or ask any of our guys if you're not sure and they'll show you. So I'm going to do something you should never do now which is unplug HDMI while it's live. It's a rather nasty thing to do. But we're going to switch back over to our system. So I'm going to give you the basic layout and while I'm talking the basic layout I'm also going to default each of these because I want, to, want you to see what it's like from scratch not from where I'm up to. And default. All right, so the first one that I'm playing with here, and the mouse is a bit oversensitive on this thing. All right, first one is our hybrid out of the AHD four channel kit. We've got one camera, which is an AHD camera. We've got the cable it comes with, it's power and B and C for video, right through to here, HDMI out into a switch, switch into the wall plate, wall plate up to the thing and the projector showing us what's going on. I've got a network cable plugged into this and into my little modem router that's sitting at the back here as well. It's a little 3G, 4G modem router so that I don't have to stuff around with our network here at work while I'm playing with this. The next device along my chain is, yes, beep, this one from Ness. So this is the HD TVI kit and again I'm going to default this one. Uh, this is annoying. So this is part of a four channel kit with a with an eight eight channel recorder. So you can buy extra cameras. It comes with four of these little ones, but you can buy extras if you wish. And I want to do this and I want to do that. And factory defaults this. Beautiful, that'll reboot over. So that's the little Nest one. Again, HD TVI, coax plus power. So that's the camera and it's coax plus power lead. It's going through a DC filter, uh, a surge protector, through its own cable, back to the power supply and into this device. HDMI out of this, network, into, network cable into my little router. And the last one, I'm gonna switch this over, is the NVR. This one's gonna be the noisy one when I do the defaults for it. Uh, just do so. This is our eight channel NVR, so the NVR 8CH uh, V2. And I go to system recovery default, default, default. 
Right. <coughs> this will beep at me because it doesn't have a hard drive in there and that will think that's the worst thing in the world that's ever happened to it. So, all right. Back over to a little AHD while this one beeps away. Uh, the, N the NVR has one camera connected up to it via PoE. Last training session I did, we covered PoE in more detail, so I'm not going to do that today. Go and watch the other one on YouTube if you want to find out all the details for that. Um, suffice it to say, I've got this camera with a PoE data cable straight into the back of this, and this is providing power and data for this one. Yes, beep. It'll do that for a little while. Right, and keep going. While it's doing that, we're going to start with the AHD one. So my plan is to do the basic setup for this one, basic setup for the beeping thing at the end, and then do the Nest setup after that one, just to show you what they're like and the differences between them. So this is the AHD one. Obviously, I plug a camera straight into it, and it's viewable. No question. It's just how an AHD system works. It's really simple that way. Same with TVI. You don't need to do any setup for the cameras themselves. You just plug them in, providing they've got power, and you're good to go. So you can see there's my little camera. She's already up and running, no problem. And because this kit by default is 24 hours a day, seven days a week recording, there is a little recording icon on each of these channels. Simple enough. To do our setup though, I need to log in. So I'm gonna sit down here because it sort of gets a bit awkward when I'm trying to do this at the height. I'd rather have it all up taller like me, but you know, this height, it's a little bit odd. Um, start my login, my super secure, super secure password. It does warn you here to change your password and you should on every single connected device whenever you do it. Default passwords and uh, default usernames are what helped uh, things like the Internet of Things hack that happened last year that took out a whole heap of different devices. Botnets can often use these sorts of things on a network because they've got an internet connection and the default username and password you can subvert what this thing is doing and use it to take down websites or all sorts of other things. So changing the username and password is a great way to avoid that problem. All right. Why is it blank? Why is it blank? Why is it blank? Sorry? Why does Because, well, there's a couple of ways. I'll show you when you, the Nest does it. Nest actually forces you to change your password first up. Ours doesn't. Um, we did it deliberately to have no password on these ones because it didn't make any difference whether it was 12345, 123456 or any of those sort of default ones to start up this way. Um, in a very real sense, it's because we wanted to make the setup as easy as possible from the first time onwards. And forcing people to choose a password can be a bit complicated sometimes. I use a password manager on my phone and laptop and everything else that costs nothing. I've got tens of thousands of different unique passwords set up on that thing for all time. Anybody who does anything on the internet should use something similar unless you have a really, really good memory for passwords and usernames and the rest of it. But it is a good point. I actually quite like the way that Nest forces you to do it with theirs. So it might be something that the factory can look at for ours as well. I hope so. We'll, um, we'll show our buyer that when he goes through. He hasn't seen one of the Nest ones running before. Um, this is the user guide. It's your wizard, your quick setup, whatever you want to call it. Um, tick that so it doesn't come up the second time you use it. But we'll do this for now. Our standard output resolution, I'm using HDMI, so we're set. You can obviously play around with that if you wish. This is the type of you know, recording we're looking for. This is a hybrid recorder, so it can do IP or AHD, or IP and analog, and this allows you to choose between them to which option you want to do. So at the moment, we're not looking for IP, so we're just going to use it the basic way. Now, this is the other simple one. DHCP, switch this on. Now I'm doing this <coughs> on this system, it's a very basic setup. So I'm using DHCP. At this point, I can pull out my phone, make sure I'm connected to my little wireless network that I've set up for today, and run the FSEYE app. Um, I can't exactly show this to you properly, but FSEYE is the app for all of our version 2 DVRs, NVRs and recorders. We used to use Goolink. There might be still a couple of recorders out there using that. FSEYE is the new version. It's got a few extra features on it, but I'll just for today just show you on the ones that we have. So I go into my main page and click Add to add a device. 
So on this page here, I've got the options to put a name, a device ID, <coughs> username and password. I can search by, whoops, hard to do this upside down. I can search by a direct IP address. So if I was doing port forwarding, I can use this app for that as well. Or I can go in here and search a QR code or I can just search on my local network. If I search on my local network, it'll bring up a sequence of devices. In my case, I've got three got that recorder, that recorder and that camera all come up as separate devices and I don't really know which one they are from the list that's here or I can hit the QR code button, brings up my camera, I go up to my device window like that, I give it a name, uh, test, if I could spell test that would help, test, okay, I've added my test device to it tap on my test device and look there it is cameras up and running that's as simple as it gets I've now got local viewing over my Wi-Fi network for this camera if I switch off my Wi-Fi and we wait internet connection down here for 3G and 4G is not great but we wait for it to connect to server and failed once on me in the first session, so let's see if it does it now. No, it's not going to. It's buffered, and there it is. So I'm now viewing remotely. This is using <coughs> my phone to the mobile tower, mobile tower pulling data down from wherever back down to this device. So I'm already viewing these cameras remotely. So if I was going to do this quickly, I could do that setup in, what, 15, 20 seconds, including searching for the device on the network. And if I go to here, then I'm done. I'm now recording 24 hours a day, I'm viewing it remotely on the app, on my phone or tablet. That's it, job's done. So that's how simple it can be. And I would say probably one out of 20 jobs are not that simple. The rest of them tend to be about that easy to get up and running for it. With the AHD it's even easier because the camera has already come up on the screen. You can see exactly what you're going to get, just plug them all in, off you go. So that's the basic setup for that one. Does that make sense? Easy enough? All right, I'm going to switch over to the NVR because this one's a little bit, well, slightly more complicated. And again, I'm going to grab my chair so that way I can try and stay out of the road. All right, so yes, I have a hard drive fault. The fault being that there is no hard drive. All right, so I got my camera plugged in, but I can't see it. Well, there's a simple reason for that. I haven't set it up yet. Um, unlike AHD, analog, HD TVI or any of those other sort of coax formats, IP cameras in general don't automatically come up on your device. If they do, they're generally in a kit like our IP8 kit where the device is set up to automatically look for a particular profile on the network that says it's a camera and then brings them up on the screen and makes it easy. So the IP camera kit is a great way for sort of retail customers or quick jobs to, to get it done. They're basically the same camera as the AHD one, but in IP format rather than AHD. Um, we don't do that on these ones because we want you to have the option to put whatever you want into these devices. So any different type of camera you want to, whether it's ours or another brand or manufacturers, to tweak the settings for everything as you go through. That one is more or less just a plug and play type of kit. These ones are a little bit more complicated because we want them to be. But let me show you how not complicated it can be. So I go into my start and my settings and guess what? Same setup, same basic stuff for it. Go here and you'll see that Oh, sorry, this shiny tablecloth's a bit rough on the mouse. Go through, same sort of settings. In here, I can obviously adjust my stream quality, so my camera recording quality on the fly. So 1080p, 960, 720 with my substreams there, plus anything else that I want to deal with. But we're going to leave it at 1080p for now. I turn on DHCP. By the way, the camera, those kits generally come with DHCP switched on, so you don't even have to turn this on to do it. Uh, now next page, again we've got our device, I'm not going to go through it because it's exactly the same thing I did a minute ago. And the last thing is different, which is, do you want to set IP channel manual? I do. Brings up this page. So, at the moment we've got eight channels over here and there's nothing assigned to any of them. We need to find those cameras and have them viewable. So, I search for different formats. Now. A few of you have done IP camera systems before. There's a format called ONVIF, which is an industry standard. 
but there are different profiles within ONVIF. So uh, the way I described it in the first session was different accents within the English language. A Southern American accent to a Northern Scottish accent to Western Sydney accent to a North Queensland accent. They are the same language in theory, but very different implementations of the same thing. Different profile versions of ONVIF may work or may not work depending on what they are. So, Keeping an eye on that and what cameras you're using with it means I can use Uniview cameras, D-Link cameras, Acti, Axis, Mobotics cameras, whatever I want with our $300 NVR. Doesn't make any difference. The cameras can be vastly more expensive and vastly more complicated and I'll still be able to record them here if I really want to. So that's what the OnVIF is and if I had an OnVIF camera on the network, this is how I would find it. The format that these are in by default that makes them a bit easier to find than some other features is I8 or A8H. And if I do a search, I can find I will have four devices on my network. Now, there are three with the same IP address, 192.168.1.150, and there's one that's sitting at 1 at 100. What this is, and I recognise it by that six-digit code, is actually the NES recorder. The Nest recorder is already on my network and it's sitting there and it's bringing out essentially an ONVIF stream so I could add my Nest as a video stream internally to ours. So that's a bit odd but you could do it if you really wanted to. In other words though, here's my camera that I'm looking for. I tick the box and it automatically goes to channel 1 and it's assigned here and over on the right hand side are the settings for that camera. So I can go through and adjust the protocol that I'm looking for, my network type, my username and password, if it had anything other than default, save it, and there it is, up in the top left hand corner. There is my camera, up and viewable. And that's the setup process for it. If you had multiple cameras, you pick them through the list, that's channel one, that's channel two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and off you go. And then suddenly I have an eight channel system running. This is the IN50 version 2 of our IP cameras. This one has a remote zoom and focus function on it. So unlike the old traditional ones where you pop open the bottom of it and manually adjust what you're looking at, this thing works through PTZ settings. So I haven't done any PTZ settings on this one. Obviously I've defaulted it, I've just found the camera. But if I bring up my PTZ settings from here, and I do my zoom, I can basically go up Fung's nose if I really want to. What a beautiful nose it is. It's great. <laughs> so it's got an automatic focus function that when it finds the zoom that you're looking for, it should try and give you the clearest image you possibly can. So it's pretty simple that way. And that is PTZ that I have not had to set up. I haven't had to go in and set the settings for it, tell it which version of PTZ or whatever. This is PTZ via Ethernet and the camera has already told the NVR that it's capable of doing it, so that's it. So really, that's my setup. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn this off because it wobbles quite a lot when it's up there and it gets quite distracting. Yeah, go on. Does it work through the coax cable? Uh, no, it doesn't. So PTZ requires some sort of control to actually make it work. So a normal PTZ camera is going to use RS-485 or something like that to make it happen. You normally have a pair of wires that are polarised, positive and negative, or you know, data and non-data, or whatever you want to call it, and they all run back into your device. So this NVR has actually got RS-485 ports on the back. So if you had a camera that needed to be manually controlled rather than through the Ethernet, you could do it this way as well. With the analog systems like the AHD one, the same sort of idea applies. You've got RS-485 ports on the back of it. You run a, a pair of wires up to your camera and from the camera into this, you go into your PTZ settings, set the type of you know, camera that it is, the type of control scheme it's using, and then up you come. And then you can still do the same sort of control with a mini PTZ camera or a big outdoor one or whatever else it is that you want to do. Does that make sense for PTZ side? Cool. Well, that was the setup for the NVR and for the AHD one. Um, obviously, with all my talking, it took a lot longer than normal, but a couple of minutes is probably about all it really takes on a simple system to get that up and running. Um, I want to show you the Nest one because I actually quite like this setup. It's been done really nicely. Now, come on, kick in. So, this is where the Nest one starts you out. And I'm going to, again, 
steel chair. So all of these devices come with their own mice, which is nice. This one requests that you change the password. Well, it doesn't actually request, it says you must. And you have to choose a decent password, otherwise it won't actually let you go past this page. So for this demo at least, I'm just gonna use capital R, lowercase a, I, a, D, I, O, uh, hash, zero, one. Oh look, it's a strong password, lovely. Do the same thing, because we've got to repeat it to make sure we've done it right. Beautiful. Cool. Doesn't let you through that fast first page until you add a password that means something or that is, in, is well set. And then now the device is activated. Now this is the wizard set up for the Nest unit. First page, uh, we can speak English or we can speak English. Uh, I'm going to turn that off because we don't want the wizard coming up every time it goes off. But when I do the default, it'll go back to that anyway. We set our time zone. You can obviously set your time. I'm not going to bother with that for now, but easy enough to do. From here, DHCP switched on by default. Um, obviously, if you turn that off, then you've got the ability to change around and alter those settings. And there's a whole heap of stuff in the network settings that I doubt that any of you are ever going to need to do, but they're there. Here is our app setup. Again, download the appropriate app, which is called Guardian something. I can't remember now. Uh, Oop. put it on my phone yesterday. Guarding Expert. Guarding Expert is the app. On the box, um, download it, scan the code in, up she pops the same way as ours does. There's the cloud information for it, cloud P2P. You can choose your own custom server and things like that if you need to as well. You can encrypt the stream if you wish. That does make it a bit slower, but it's possible to do. Uh, yes, here's your port information, so if you're going to do port forwarding based on your network, that's all there for you. You can also enable a dynamic DNS service, all as part of the wizard. There's our hard drive, so from here I can do an initialization which formats the thing. I'm not going to do it because we're just using this as a demo, but there it is. And I've got the option to either do continuous 24 hour a day recording or motion detection 24 seven on all channels. I select motion and I start all day motion detection recording on all channels, yes, okay, and I'm done. So now I'm recording motion 24 hours a day, seven days a week on all my channels. I haven't set any areas of detection or anything else like that, but it's just done a basic motion detection on everything. And that's it, Cameras, the system's up and running. There's only one thing I wanna do at this point, which is, Go into the menu, configuration, change my resolution so it's actually proper. Wait for it, up she comes. And it's even got that, which I quite like. And there we go. There is my little HD TVI system up and running. So yeah, simple as that. So again, these are setups that take a couple of minutes. And by far the majority of the jobs that we get and that we do, that's how simple it goes. Um, well, I'm using a domestic modem router here. I've got a DHCP server set up and turned on. I've got universal plug and play or P2P or PMP or whatever turned on in my device. So everything just works really, really simply. And that's how we hope it works all the time. I know that it doesn't because I've spent a lot of time on phones and, e and emails and logging in remotely to systems to make this happen. But that's how simple these things can be. Our early generation ones, as Mike was saying, were a lot more complicated, had a lot more setup and problems involved. This is a lot simpler now than it used to be. That all makes sense? Great, you're all finished, you can go. Or you can hang around and listen to some of the things that can go wrong and how to fix them as well. Up to you entirely. All right, so let's start with a few of those, shall we? So let's go back over to the AHD one. I'm going to set up motion detection on this one and show you how to do this. It's on our FAQ page. But by default, this thing is recording 24 hours a day. If I go into my settings page, to my channel, to my schedule record to start off with. So first off, we've enabled recording, which is good. We want that to happen. And currently we're doing all day recording on a schedule. In other words, for these periods of day, we are simple as that. If I turn off all day recording, then I can pick and choose just by clicking and dragging 
what times of day I want to set my recording to work for. If I go down here and tick motion, then I can also do add motion sections here, for example, or whatever else I want to do. I can make a complete mess out of that using different colors because you know I'm a child. But the idea being, you can pick and choose which type of recordings you want at any time you want to. Now I'm going to get out of that and then back in. Oh no, what a mess. So now, 24 hour a day, seven day a week recording and it's on schedule. Well, I want it on motion. I choose motion from my list. That's good. So I'm now looking for motion all the time. Down the bottom here under advanced, you have the ability to add a buffer. So some time before the actual motion and some time after the motion stops. That could be very useful or not. It depends on your environment and your situation. What it will do is it'll keep a buffer of say five seconds always running and when motion happens it pulls that five seconds of buffer that it has and adds that to the recording so you can see what happened just prior to somebody moving um, and then post recording obviously if somebody runs into the store to scream at you and then stands there with their hands on their chest while they yell at you you might want a bit of post recording time while they're standing there they're not moving around much but their lips certainly are and you might not be able to see that up close so post recording is there for you too um, obviously I'm doing this per channel but I can copy this here to the other channels of recording at the same time. Now in our motion settings I'm only going to set this up for channel one but again you can set these up as individual and you should set them up for individual selections for each channel. <coughs> From here I'm going to enable motion detection and that if that's not on you can see all these options don't work enable it, go into my area settings and look here you all are. A fairly disreputable lot so I'm going to set motion detection across the lot of you. Click and drag that but it means that if anything happens up here or around here that's not going to set off my motion. It's just going to stay as it is. Go down to OK. Got my sensitivity set to standard. My arming schedule is in here so I can tweak this a little bit if I want to. Uh, it is copied from the previous page, so if you've altered the other one, then that should appear in here as well to see what you're seeing. And the linkage is the important bit, so I don't want an audio warning every time motion goes off, because that's annoying. I don't want email linkage for here, but I can. Again, that's really irritating, because every little bit of motion will set off an email to get sent out to somebody, and you can end up sort of with spam filters and other problems because you've sent so many emails that your, you know, that your email service won't actually let you do it anymore. Uh, if you've got a camera or a setup where the motion is absolutely minimal, the email linkages work really well. There are very few situations where we've been in where that works perfectly. So just keep that in mind. Customers who want to ask for that, often ask for it to be turned off about 10 minutes after they asked for it to be turned on. So just keep that in mind. Um, upload to center, if you've got the video client running on your computer or another computer on the network, then you can upload the fact that motion went off to them. You can trigger an alarm output. So this has a range of alarm outputs on the back here. So if camera one goes off, trigger the relay to turn on the light in the driveway that you know the floodlight that goes off to show everything that's happening you can do that for you as well um, you could open a garage door with it if you really wanted to somebody drives up in the driveway hey the garage door is open and you come no problem at all um, again if it was your house and you had complete control up to that point might not be a bad idea but for everybody else probably not down the bottom you've got the linkage here so this is what happens when the motion goes off on this channel in this case it triggers the recording on channel one so instead of sending every camera start recording when motion goes off only this camera goes off if i had like a sequence where I knew they were going to be coming past this one to that one to that one, I might want to set off those three cameras to start recording when the first one is triggered or something else along those lines. I have had customers that have used it that way before as well. Generally though, you just want one-to-one -one recording. If it's motion here and motion there, then those ones are going to go off and tell you what's going on. Beautiful, that's motion. Set up, save, and done. So that's motion set for just channel one that's there. There's not a lot of motion in the frame though, or no Nick's moving around, and guess what? Little running man goes off. That's the icon to say there's been motion, and the red dot there is the fact that it's actually recording. Simple enough. If we stop moving around so much, then the motion will go off again. So that's motion. It's the same on the other DOS, uh, the IP camera system, as it is on this one. Very, very simple. 
Okay, that's motion. Um, let me see, what was I going to talk about next? A um, couple of things you need to be aware of. Number one thing is the hard drive. When was the hard drive in this unit formatted? No idea. Was it when the factory put the hard drive in? Did they format it? Don't know. Could have been 20 past 5 on a Friday afternoon and you know they didn't get to it. I don't know. You don't know either, but if you, unless you check it or do it manually here, your customer is going to call you up in two years saying, we were broken into, but I can't find the footage. You're going to go back and realize that the hard drive has been pristine and new the whole time and hasn't actually been recording a damn thing. So one of the things I always do as part of a setup is to go in, choose my hard drive, and format the thing. Because as soon as, as, so long as you know that it's been formatted, you know that it's ready to go now and it's ready for recording and ready for this device to work. Does that make sense? So yes. Um, the Nest one, as part of its wizard process, asks you if you want to initialize it there. Again, that's a good approach. I quite like that. But this one, it doesn't do that. When our techs put them in here, generally speaking, they format the hard drive. If it's one of the guys on the floor and they're in a rush, they might not have time to format it for you or so on. It's still good practice when you get out to site to format it anyway, okay? And it's going to reboot and beep at me in a second as well. Thank you. That's the basics for the motion detection, the hard drive setup. Um, I'm not going to go through like setting up an account password or any of that sort of stuff. It's all pretty self-explanatory. What I'm trying to get to today is some of the problems you can come across with these ones. So we've done motion detection. We've done the basics with the hard drive. Um, to check whether something's recording or not or whether it has recorded or not, uh, log in. There are two ways that I like. Yes. So I can go to my playback screen. I can choose my camera, I can search, and I can see, <laughs> you probably can't see it from back there, there's this tiny, tiny little yellow bar in the middle of my frame here. It tells me there was motion recording at, I don't know, whatever 11 o'clock was on this thing here. So that's how I can tell that motion's working. If there are multiple channels, then I could see blue for 24 hour recording and whatever else might be on the device. But I just formatted my hard drive, so there's not gonna be anything on there other than this. That's a good way to see whether your hard drive, whether you're actually recording. Blue would be schedule, yellow for motion, and so on. You can also, through settings, have a look in under system and stream info. And from here, you can see first channel Mainstream is about 4,000 kilobits per second. Second channel is 89 kilobits per second. Obviously, something's happening on channel one and not much is happening on channel two or three or four, which is what's going on behind the scenes here as well. It's useful to be able to know a couple of different ways of checking whether that's working properly. All right. Um, and factory defaults are under recovery condition. You can just choose which ones you want to default if you end up in trouble. Right, let's move across to the networking side because this is where it gets fun. Yeah. One question on that one. Mm. Resetting with our password. Yeah. If you did it twice, previously the old DOS one, mm -hmm. you had to put it here. Yep. Reset. Yep. Uh, Still true. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. There are, in theory, two people in the world that know how to put a, to get a master password and the chipset and whatever to make these things switch over. One of them works out the back here and the other one's at the factory in China, uh, in Taiwan. Or, um, the idea being we want that to be as secure as possible. Having a generic list of master passwords or, or whatever is going to uh, cause that a problem. What a lot of my installers will do is that when they set up accounts, in here, you've got a standard admin password and a guest password for it. A lot of them will set up a master administrator password that's a common one that they use often, you know, um, and then have a sub admin password that is for everyday use that they give to the customer themselves. Um, you could then set up a sub password for guests so that you can view it on the screen, but you can't actually play back or do any of the settings or whatever else. But having that two step of administrator passwords means one guy you always have access to it. You know, you can come back as the professional installer back on site, consist, consult your list of passwords, Bob's DVR, right, okay, password in, reset, do whatever you need to do from there. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we haven't done that. Um, 
It's more in the realm, it's basically about security. We want to try and make it as secure as possible to run these things. Um, that means it's inconvenient. So if Aurelio has a, a customer who's forgotten their password, it's you know, three and a half, four hours drive from where he is back to Melbourne to get that back to us. Um, our techs are generally happy to do the, you know, the reset here. They don't mind doing it. They can generally do it pretty quickly. If they're here, if they're at their desk, it can be done pretty simply. Um, call up our guys in the showroom, organize that beforehand, make sure there's time and window available for it, or send it back through our normal returns process and we'll get it looked at and change, you know, it's defaulted back to the, the master, oh, the, the standard password again. Um, at least at the moment, that's the only way to do it. So. Uh, this was 40 hours long. Yeah, sure. Channels do they do? This one's got four channels of audio recording. The NVR has none, uh, and the the NES I think has two, no, four channels of audio recording as well. Uh, it varies from device to device. The IP one, I believe you can still record the audio if it's integrated into the Ethernet, into the signal from the camera itself. So if you had an IP camera with audio, you should be able to record it from there, but there's no external audio direct input to the device. Uh, there are RCAs at this end for it. So yeah, basically microphone level signals coming into it quite, yeah, work quite well. Um, yeah, okay. They're the basics of it. Can I move on to the networking side now? Everybody okay with that? This is the bit that causes most people the most problems. So let's start with here. I selected DHCP to start off with. Um, DHCP is a way of assigning an IP address to this device inside my router. My router sees that there's a device there that wants an IP address and then it gives it one. Within a certain range, Easy, done. It's why when your mobile phone connects to a, you know, your modem or router at home for the first time, it comes up and it doesn't need to do anything silly. It's the same sort of thing with these, your smart TV, your you know, Netflix box, whatever else is going on. That's how DHCP works. On a lot of corporate networks, you won't have the option to use DHCP. Or on a private network, you might want to put this device somewhere specific rather than just let the modem decide where to put it. So DHCP is certainly the easier option. It makes all the plug and play, the apps and everything work much easier and much quicker. So selecting it to start off with using your wizard is a very good idea. However, there's one potential problem that comes up with this, and I see it quite a lot. It's with Telstra modems or routers and other ones that use a different IP address for their default gateway. So my gateway here is 192.168.1.1, right? Basic one, TP-Link modem router, no worries. A lot of Optus, you know, TPG, whatever else will use that address range. Telstra will often use 10.0.1.138 as their default. So. They do it as well, Ionet, beautiful. Well, if Ionet's doing it, then TPG will probably do it at some point as well, or, well, now they're all the same company, who knows, but makes it a bit of a mess, but. Ionet do Technicolors now. Yep, and they're all, yeah, okay. But Telstra also doing 10.0.0.1. Yeah, exactly. And if you choose DHCP here, and the default gateway is 10.0. something then this DHCP system won't see it, and so it won't actually get an IP address on the network properly. However, the simple way to do it is knowing that you've got a 10.0.0. whatever device, change this IP address, so if I get out of this and do it as the user guide, which we were looking at before, from here, I turn this off, I use an IP address range that's somewhere in that range, 10.0.0 well, 10.0.0.5, for example, I use my subnet mask the same on my default gateway to the gateway address of the device for the modem, 10.0.0.138, for example, and then I switch DHCP on again. What that will then do is it'll look for DHCP in the right range for the modem, and then you should be able to do everything else that simply. Okay, that's a little one that works really, really well. Otherwise, you can manually assign an IP address to it here that you've already chosen and assigned beforehand. That is uh, two options. Both of them work equally well for what you're trying to do here. Um, yes, the DHCP that's in these is rather primitive, so it won't look well outside its range to try and find DHCP somewhere else. So you might have to sort of nudge it in the right direction to make sure that works properly. So that's an easy way to get the thing online. So I'm going to skip that, skip that.
Um, in the network settings that are here, you can see there are DNS uh, servers here set up. First DNS is my modem, my gateway, and there is no second DNS set up for it. A DNS is kind of like a phone book, um, you know, Bob, James, here's his mobile number or here's his direct number. That's the, the phone book is the signing those two things together. It's like google.com.au equals 72.43.120 or whatever it is, that actual number that's there. The DNSs that are in here rely on this device telling things where things are. If you set the second DNS here to 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 that can solve a few problems when it comes to remote viewing and accessing as well. We don't do it by default because generally speaking you don't need it, but you can do that. That's a Google standard DNS server. So it's a useful one to have just in your uh, bag of tricks if you have to. Uh, your remote port and HTT port and so on are for the port forwarding sides and I'll show you that in a minute through the router itself. Very good. That's our basic networking settings. There is dynamic DNSing in here if you need to use that. There's the email settings for it all and the Q FAQs on our website show you how to do that step by step to run through it if you really need to. And from here, we've got my FSEYE app is up and running so it knows that that is active. And I've also got a web server enabled so I can view this via a website on my local network to see it. Very good. So, those are the basics at that end for the networking. So, let me not sit down anymore, stand up and do some moving around. Okay, so, let's jump back over to my laptop. This will take a second to come back up. All right, thank you, Jimmy. See you. See ya. So, this is my little device. Uh, and I will go back to my basic setup page, log in. Okay, so this is my setup page for my modem and router. And this is the bit that's important when you're trying to get your network set up up and running if you're not sure why it's not working already. Uh, in here I can see that I have four wired clients and I can scroll down and have a look what they are. I've got one at 1.100, I know that's the Nest device from playing with it before. I've got one at 102, one at 104 and one at 150. From what we're looking at in here when we set up the camera, we know that this camera has gone to 150. So that is my camera and the other two must logically be one of the DVRs and the other one of the NVRs. If I go to 192.168.1.150, this is the login for the camera itself and I'm not running flash on this computer so it's going to disable some of the stuff that's here but from this camera I can do individual settings for the camera itself I can go into its video parameters and turn on wide dynamic range and all those sorts of things so this is logging in directly to the camera it's a useful thing to do before you finish up at a job site because you might want to tweak what the camera can see and how it sees what it sees uh, I go across to here and go to my one of my devices, oh James go away. I can go into my configuration from here and I can do all the same sorts of things that I was doing on the DVR directly but I can do it through the web interface as well. I prefer to do it through the web interface because I've got a keyboard and I can actually type stuff in. So if I go and try to personalize this for a customer and I go to my video settings, no I want my display settings actually. From here I can change my channel name to training and I can do that I'll save those settings and then when I go back into it well on the DVR you can see it already but the idea would be uh, oh no I haven't need to change the resolution okay on the DVR itself it actually comes up with training above it so I've typed that in it makes it easier and quicker and personalizes it kitchen door laundry door front door driveway whatever your customer gets to see exactly what they're looking at pretty good uh, in my network I've got my devices that are here the stuff that you need to have active to make this easy for yourself well under networking we've got where is my LAN settings and there's my DHCP server. We were talking about it before. This is how these devices talk. I can increase this range if I want to or decrease the range 
uh, whatever I want to do. I can turn it off if I wish. Uh, and yes, my default gateway and DNSs and so on are all there. There's things that you can play with and change, but the DHCP enabled and turned on and in this range is what you need to know to get your device action on online. At the moment, I have got five devices, my Surface laptop, my phone over here, and I've got one of them here at 100 against the Nest device. I've got the two recorders sitting at the bottom of this list. Does that make sense? So it's easy to see from here what's connected. From here, I can also assign an IP address to a device, either within that range or outside that range. So if I've got other devices on the network that keep knocking it off or doing other silly things, I can put a manual IP address in here outside or inside this range that says DVR X equals this all the time. It always stays exactly where this is. So each modem and router does this differently, but that's a useful thing. If you find that a camera keeps dropping in and out, it might be somebody walking in with their iPad and then walking out again, stealing an IP address or doing something else. Depending on the modem or router, that could cause you problems. So manually assigning those can be a useful thing. Uh, let me have a look. I've got dynamic DNS in here I'm not currently using, but again, that's an option if you don't have a static IP address for your device. Under my, let's see, I don't want that. I want NAT forwarding. Got port triggering and virtual servers. In this case, we're going to do a virtual server. I can, in here, call it my DVR service. I can use an external port, say 5050. My internal port 5050, uh, whoops, internal IP address 192.168.0.102. Internal port 5050, TCP, done. So that's a port forwarding basic setup for it. I don't want to go through the absolute details of it because every different modem does it differently, calls it differently, and it works slightly differently. But getting to know a particular brand or a range of modems is a very useful way to do it. You would only do this if you don't have access to this feature here. Universal plug and play is what TP-Link calls it. PNP, P2P, all sorts of other names, different modems can call it. It is the ability that allows your phone to instantly connect to it via the app and then view it remotely because it automatically configures all the ports and everything else it needs to do and sends it out to the outside world. So you really, 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 really want to have that in your modem to make this setup as simple as possible. Obviously mine does, which is why I can do a 30 second setup from go to woe with these devices earlier. All right, if your modem doesn't have it and it's 25 years old, full of chip fat and dust, then get rid of it. If it doesn't have it or it's locked out because Telstra, Optus, IINet, whatever doesn't give you access to do it, see if you can swap the modem over for another one or you might have to call one of those providers and say, hey, can I actually use my modem the way I want to use it? So those can sometimes be options or they will say, hey, we've got this great deal on a new modem that's got all these extra features. Why don't you spend $400 with us? No, I think I'll go down to my local store and spend $150 on the same thing. Thank you very much. These are things that you have to consider when you're starting to do the job. Just plugging in the cameras and saying, right, there you are, off you go, might not be enough. Sometimes it comes down to the rest of their network to cause problems for you. Okay, very good. So, basic networking stuff. There are also the ability to do bandwidth controls and depending on the modem or router or switch or whatever you're doing, you might be able to do a VPN and dump the cameras here and all the rest of the traffic over here and so on and so on. That's beyond what we're going to do today because that would be an old, a whole hour session in itself just to go through all the details and make sure that works properly. But all of that is possible. If your corporate network's getting overclogged with crap, and you've still got to put in another 32 cameras, then you might start having to look at those more advanced options to make that happen. Um, and in which case, if it's a corporate network, talk to the IT guy on site and say, hey, I need some space, what can you do for me? And let him worry about it, because it's his network, it's his uh, domain to play around with, so you may as well play nice with him as well. Um, and I say him as a bit of a... Um, Standard, I don't know many network admins or sysadmins that are women yet, although I do know that they exist out there. It just tends to be a bit of a male-dominated do area, I'm afraid. Um, yes. Right. So, basic networking stuff. What else was I going to talk to you about? Um, actually, a bit of troubleshooting. General purpose troubleshooting. Um, finding out why something's not working. Thankfully, there's nothing in that. 
Finding out why something's not working is a bit of a skill in itself. And a lot of you who have installers have done this for a long time and know the basics for it all. But it really helps us here if you call up and you've already done a few of the basic tests. The most common question I get when somebody calls up out of the blue is, camera's not working. That's good. That tells me not a lot. Okay, what else can we t why find out about it? What do you mean? The camera's not working. Okay, is it an IP camera system? Is it an AHD one? If they plugged it in right. Okay, with it's an AHD one, the camera's not working. Cover over the lens and see if the little infrareds start to glow. If they do, it's getting power. If they don't, well, it's not getting power, so there's a problem there. If it's getting power and the cable in between is good, you can test it out on a short length and see if it works properly. Okay, then we've got a problem. If you plug it into one of the other ports on the board and it doesn't work on some of them and works on others, there might be a problem with the recorder itself or the camera or the cabling and so on. But identifying it point by point to try and work it out makes a lot of sense. When it comes to IP cameras, it's a little bit more complicated because obviously you won't see them when they first come up unless it's part of that kit. Plug it in, you've still got the same thing. There's network and power activity lights on the back of the recorder in this case, but that's because this is a PoE version. If you haven't got that and you're running it through a PoE switch, have a look and see if there's activity lights on the switch to see if something's happening on the port that this is connected to. If it is, cover the, this over. Have a look at the infrareds and see if they come on. If they don't, then power's not getting to the camera for some reason, and you need to work out why. Either the camera's faulty, which does happen, or you stuff something up. So in this case, me being the wonderful network engineer and cable monkey that I am, I have built this fantastic Cat6 lead. Did this this morning. Did not do it properly in terms of putting the, you know, the PVC inside the outside, but it was more to prove a point than anything else. I think my cable's perfect because I pulled out a continuity tester and plugged it in and it said they, it worked. It had the lights that went on and the lights, you know, the lights went on and said, yeah, of course it does. It works, no problem at all. And I turn this on and look, my little tester goes one, two, three, what have I got? Upside down, doesn't matter. My little tester's saying my cable's fine. Whoops, now I've played around with it so I've actually broken it. But it was going through sequence one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on each of them. All right. I'm going to hand this around, particularly the guys have done a lot of cabling. Have a look at the ends of this one and tell me what I've done wrong. The simple, the simple reason for it, and I've actually seen this on a job site before, and caused a lot of grief because I assumed the customer knew what they were doing and clearly they didn't. It's straight white. Orange, orange, white, blue, blue, white, brown, brown, white, green, green, white, or some variation of it through there. It's perfect, copper to copper, end to end, no worries at all, but it's definitely not a 568A or 568B spec. A PoE camera like this one, or this communicating to the network, needs a particular sequence of cables to actually make it work. When you straight wire or bugger up the wiring for a Cat6, the power that's on one of these wires is now not going to the power socket at the other end, it's going to one of the data bits, or it's going from one of the data bits to a ground bit and suddenly nothing's working. It was frustrating on this particular job site because I was playing around there for half an hour. Some cameras would appear, some wouldn't appear, some would power up, some wouldn't power up. I thought it could be recorder, power supplies, network switch, all sorts of other stuff. I did not think to check the cabling. Now, the first thing I do is check the cabling. I pull it out and have a look and see which configuration it's in every time. So just because your first year apprentice has done his cabling course or somebody who's put this in has done the course for it all does not necessarily mean it works. And these cable testers really only show you that copper is connected to copper. If you've done it completely completely the wrong way like I have, this will not show that to you. Having a better data tester like the T3ones in the cupboard or something else that's out there to actually show you the wiring that's going through there will give you a much better idea of what's going wrong with your system. And all of you that are doing anything in this realm will be doing a lot more data work as the years go on. So having a good data tester is definitely worth it.